My name is Mike Aben, and welcome to my KSP campaign. In this episode, you're going to see me finally sort out my interplanetary communication system. We're going to launch two satellites from a single vehicle that are going to extend my communication range out to Duna and anything else in between. Uh, this has been something that's been a long time coming, especially considering that I have a probe on its way to Duna right now that I can't even communicate with. So like I said, this is going to be done from with the addition of just two satellites. They're going to go into a geostationary orbit. And I'm going to launch them from the same vehicle. Um, and so that's going to involve setting up a proper transfer orbit so that the two satellites will end up in the appropriate position. So we're going to talk about all this. It's going to be a, a nice, heavily uh, orbital mechanic-y <laughs> type of episode. Also going to talk about remote tech because I do, I, I am playing with remote tech and how to get those satellites to all communicate with each other in a reliable way. But right now I am looking at how to spend my 2,772 science that uh, I now have thanks to my the return of my Minmus mission at the conclusion of the last episode. And I'm working on Tier 6 and Tier 7. Uh, I can't get past Tier 7 until I've upgraded the vehicle, or not the vehicle assembly, what am I talking about? Until I've upgraded the Research and Development Center. And the first one you see me grab there, that was Advanced Aerodynamics. That was an easy one for me, uh, because that gives me air brakes as well as lots of wings and control surfaces and this will allow me to uh, build something a little bit more aerodynamically sophisticated. Specifically, I'm thinking about getting into space shuttles. I really do want to build a space shuttle. So that was an easy one to pick. After that, a little bit of umming and awing uh, going over these Tier 7 uh, level tech nodes. I can pick up, what do I got, 1,600, so there are 300 each, so I can pick up five more, and what I decided to go with was nuclear propulsion. That was actually a relatively easy decision, nuclear propulsion. It would have been really nice to have some nuclear engine for my Moho Pro, but uh, nuclear engines, uh, number one, it's going to improve my uh, interplanetary capabilities for sure, but also it unlocks a whole proliferate of nuclear nodes that are coming up all coming from the uh, interstellar mod and there are some awesome parts in there so that was an easy choice after that i got field science for rover wheels finally i can build myself a freaking car and get around properly without a jet engine on the back um and also comes with this atmospheric spectro variometer <laughs> i think i'm saying that right uh, another science part Always need science parts. And speaking of science parts, I also unlock science tech. Has resource scanners. I do want to get into some resource harvesting. Just the scanners, though. No harvesting just yet. And an infrared telescope. Another science part. I got high-powered electrics uh, for the Gigantor solar arrays. Some bigger ba a bigger battery. A fuel cell. Really useful for getting through the night sides of uh, planets. And uh, a thermoelectric generator. Also a nice, useful part. And finally, I went with high altitude flight. Again, awesome plane parts. How can you resist awesome plane parts? Most especially uh, a Mark II crew can and uh, a radial Mark II radial docking port. That, uh, and again, space shuttles, right? Need that. Now, let's see here. Uh, it's going to take two and a half days for that advanced aerodynamics and almost five days for all the rest of it. I also got to spend my got six build points that I'm going to be putting towards the space plane hangar and the vehicle assembly building. And I decided to put most of it towards the space plane hangar. I've been finding with the vehicle assembly building, um, I quite often am pushing out rockets faster than I can uh, up or recondition the launch pad. So it doesn't make sense to put a whole lot more points into the vehicle assembly building. So the space plane hangar definitely got the majority of it. After that, it was, well, time warping until the launch pad was reconditioned. Like I said, that seems to be what is holding up my launches the most. And then it was time to uh, launch these interplanetary relays. And here we are on this nice sunset launch, which shows off the hills and the mountains behind the Kerbal Space Center. You can see I got a single stage lifter, 2.5 meter parts again with a uh, good old mainsail there on the bottom but of course this launch isn't about the lifter this launch is about the payload 
All right. Okay, so we'll take a look at the payload in just a second. First, I need to find a communitron antenna. There it is. Oh, didn't get it. This is so that I will remain in contact with mission control once uh, the Kerbal Space Center drops below the horizon. Okay, let's get up to where the payload is. So in here, okay, let's maybe some lights. Ooh, I should have put more lights on here. <laughs> so anyway, there's this tower. I got two satellites. And we're going to put these satellites in geostationary orbits, and I do want them to be 120 degrees apart from each other. And I know you can't really see them very well, and even once I got into orbit, uh, now I'm on the night side. Uh, maybe a sunset launch wasn't the best idea in the world. Uh, so you really can't see them that well right now, but they are on uh, infernal robotic hinges. Um, but before... I can extend them and allow you to get a really good look at them. Uh, we're going to need to do a little bit of orbiting, orbital maneuvering and get this uh, transfer vehicle into the right orbit. So as I mentioned, I want to get into a geostationary orbit. I already have this one satellite up there. It's Interplanetary Relay 1. Well, Interplanetary Relay 1 really isn't an interplanetary relay at all, but we'll select it as a target anyway. Yeah, it isn't an interplanetary relay because I got mixed up between megameters and gigameters and, well, the less spoken about that, the better for now. But regardless, I want to end up in a position 120 degrees. I want both of these two satellites to be 122 degrees on either side of interplanetary relay one. So I'm trying to remember which way around it measures phase angle. So I'm just going to time warp and there my my phase angle just went over it's now in the 350s so that means it, yeah it must take from my position and measure in a counterclockwise direction so if i want my satellite to end up 120 degrees ahead right around here of interplanetary relay one that means i want a phase angle of 240 degrees that's going to work. And the way I'm going to drop these two satellites is they're going to drop 240 degrees from each other. In other words, the two satellites once dropped are going to rotate another 240 degrees before the next ones drop. And that should get them all into the perfect position. But the first part of this is to start my burn with my intercept angle with interplanetary relay one is 240 degrees. All right, so there we go. And we're going to continue this burn until my apoapsis gets up to that geostationary altitude, which is 2,868.75 kilometers, or, or thereabouts. I can tweak the, the final number as we get closer. And in the interest of time and the fact that we are on the night side, why don't we cut to the tail end of this particular burn? All right, one more? Good enough. Let's go with that. All right, there was a lot of gimbling going on there, so uh, let's cut that gimbling down. There we go. Okay, so i got to think about communication, because once I'm out at Apoapsis, we'll be out of range of curb and surface with the communitron, so i got to find a dish antenna. There should be a dish antenna down on here somewhere. Let's see. And uh, I've noticed with these satellites, uh, quite often the communitrons work just enough with the... Uh, the lower comsats that are down there, but I don't want to depend on that because, I don't know, I, I've not gone over the math to find out if it's possible that they might be out of communication range with the communitron, so I'd rather rely on a dish antenna. Okay, there wasn't one on the main vehicle, but there is one here, so we will activate this one. I don't need one on the main vehicle now that I think about it. I must have been thinking about that when I was designing. And we will target interplanetary relay one and I'll make sure to go out to interplanetary relay one and take one of its dish antennas and point it at uh, this particular vessel to ensure that we have communication the whole time and then once that was accomplished it was just a matter of time warping out until uh oh we're in the sun here let's orient this so that uh my solar panels I didn't put a lot of solar panels on the main vessel it doesn't really need it I just put a few on the tower here Oh yeah, it's not going to fully charge because if you notice there, I do have a battery that's shorted out. Thank you, dang it. I'll just have to live with that. 
at least now you can get a bit of a better view of the vehicle. Anyway, as I was saying, uh, what we're doing now is we're just going to time warp out to Apoapsis, get on to the second phase of this maneuver, uh, which is to increase our periapsis. Um, how this is going to work, if I want the satellites to be 240 degrees apart from each other, um, well, they're going to be in orbits that are six hours long. So 240 is two-thirds of a circle. Two-thirds of six hours is uh, four hours. So what I want to do is I want to put this particular vehicle into an orbit that has a period of four hours. So we're time warping out towards Apoapsis, and I'm stopping. Well, I set the alarm to stop at 10 minutes before Apoapsis. And because I do have some stuff I still need to do before I end up dropping a satellite. Um, and like I said, what I want to do is I want to point this thing prograde. And then I'm going to start to burn prograde and get my periapsis up until the point where the period is four hours. So if this thing is in a period that, or an orbit that has a period of four hours, then by, and I drop a satellite, then by the time, uh, we get back to Apoapsis to get ready to drop our next satellite. Four hours will obviously have gone by. That, the meanwhile, the first satellite that I dropped, I will circularize. It will move through 240 degrees, two thirds of its orbit, so that when I drop this next satellite, it will end up in the perfect position. And and perhaps I didn't explain that particularly well, and maybe it doesn't make 100% sense to you right yet. Don't worry about it. It will soon once you see this all in action. So there you go. I'm starting my burn and again. My objective is to push my orbital period up to four hours. Um, you might notice I'm not quite on the prograde vector. I'm also not quite on a pitch of zero. Uh, the reason for all of that is because I'm still about five minutes away from Apoapsis. I'm doing that so that I have time to... Uh, drop the satellite and get it ready for its orbital insertion. Um, I'm also adjusting my inclination at the same time, and I'm also pitching up and down uh, to try and keep my apoapsis at 2,868.7 kilometers. I want to keep that apoapsis at that number, uh, and I also don't want it to get too far away from me, so I'm adjusting the throttle, I'm adjusting my pitch, I'm adjusting my inclination. I'm kind of doing a lot of different things all here at the same time. But the main thing I'm looking at, once again, is my orbital period that I want to be four hours. So why don't we just uh, cut ahead a little bit as I start, as I finish off this particular burn, and... Oh, shoot. Oh, I was looking at the wrong number. I was looking at the time to the equatorial descending node. The orbital period is 12 minutes more than four hours now. Oh, shoot. Oh, well. <laughs> Luckily, I built this thing uh, with quite a lot of fuel, so... And this won't cost too much. So, obviously, burning retrograde, bringing that orbital period back down. Oh, there we go. Just uh, a couple of tenths of seconds left to do. So uh, we'll turn the thrust down on the uh, engine as far as we can go. Give it one more tiny puff. Beauty. There we go. That's it. Okay, now comes the time to release our first satellite. So we'll turn this thing back up towards its normal vector, pointing north. And we will make sure that the solar panels are well exposed there. Pointing towards the sun. Oh, that definitely looks okay. All right, now comes my favorite part of this particular mission. Oh, let, wait, wait, wait. Let's get this back so that you can see this really well. There we go. So we're going to open up the Infernal Robotics window. And I've got a couple of Infernal Robotic hinges. <laughs> I love the sound effects on that, too. Nay. Okay, let's close the window. We are done. Uh, yeah, I love Infernal Robotics. I tend to do simple things like that, not, not anything crazy, but uh, incredibly practical too. Uh, so, we will open up the solar panels on this guy, get it ready for release. There's also a Communitron on here. We will activate that. The main, so main purpose of that Communitron actually is so, because this satellite is what is communicating with uh, mission control. So the Communitron will connect 
this, this satellite, once it's released to the transfer vehicle, so the transfer vehicle will still have a signal. Okay, so when we release this satellite, it's going to need to burn prograde. So uh, we're going to need to orient it so that it is burning prograde right now. So we're going to control from the probe body that makes up the satellite. And is that the prograde vector? I always get them mixed up when they're right on here sometimes. Oh, wait, wait, wait. No, this is pointing west. No, no, that's a retrograde vector. Okay, we got to point east to the prograde vector. And again, the reason I'm pointing prograde is because this thing will be burning prograde and it's going to be moving in this direction anyway. And then that way I can safely burn prograde without worrying about driving this satellite straight back into this transfer vehicle. Okay, so there we are. We're on the prograde vector and we are on a funny angle. So we will rotate so that we are still oriented north-south too. That looks pretty good. I think so. Okay, we are ready to release the satellite. So right click on the decoupler and decouple. There we go, we're off. So there it is, it is free. Okay, so what I'm gonna do, I got one dish antenna pointing at interplanetary relay one. I'm gonna take the other dish antenna and target the vehicle which must be interplanetary relays probe because these two guys are going to end up outside of communitron range soon enough so uh, we got to make sure they can still remain in contact with each other i don't want to lose contact with that main vessel and i suspect this thing has a silly name too so we'll rename it yeah i don't want it to be that interplanetary relay two. there we go all right and let's bounce back to the transfer vehicle again and oh it's it obviously got some sort of a kick when it was decoupled so we'll put it back there we go and again solar panels are nicely exposed to the sun good okay so we're going to take the other dish antenna that's on the other satellite and we're going to point it at interplanetary relay 2 and that way we can be ensured that everybody will be talking to each other. We're not going to lose contact with any of these satellites. I am playing with remote tech, obviously, and uh, I don't want anything to go dead. All right, this guy is ready to, ready to go, ready to complete its orbital insertion. So we're going to activate the engine. There we go. Doesn't need a lot of fuel for this. We'll turn this so that uh, the solar panels are pointing north-south, so they will get 100% exposure to the sun. And then it's just a simple matter of circularizing. All right, we'll start at a low thrust here. So we're a decent distance away from the vehicle, and then we'll pump it up. And again, the main thing I'm looking at here is orbital period. I want orbital period to be as close as I can get to six hours. I'm also keeping an eye on my apoapsis because I want to keep it in around 2,867 point, no, what is it? 2,868.7 kilometers or thereabouts. Um, I will say um, this was, the, the whole geostationary thing is not, there's nothing, there's no contract here asking me to do a geostationary orbit. Uh, this is just me. I could have easily put these things into a, any kind of an orbit and they would have function just fine. Uh, the other thing as well is it's very common to put uh, three satellites into geostationary orbit, so it's very easy to modify this mission and drop three satellites instead of two. It'll work just as well, and if you just do exactly what I'm doing here, except with three satellites, those three satellites will each end up 120 degrees from each other in a geostationary orbit, if that's what you want. The reason I'm only doing two is because, well, I already have one in geostationary orbit. There's no reason for me to put three more. But anyway, you've seen all this before, so we'll just cut uh, to the completion of the circularization. Alrighty, uh, still uh, almost a little less than a tenth of a second off. We can, we can do this. <laughs> I, just, I went over it just a little bit. I'm going to turn the thrust down as low as it'll go. One teeny tiny little puff in a retrograde direction. There we go. It's now bouncing on either side of a day. That's, that's just about perfect. Now, actually, I do have a contract to do. 
And it is one that you've seen before. This one's been hanging over my head for a while. There it is. It is to uh, launch a satellite that can reach the inner planets communication-wise. Uh, and I, I botched this one earlier because of <laughs> antenna and aptitude. But now I think I finally have the situation where I can get this one out of the way because this antenna can reach any of the inner planets. I just got to be able to activate it here. There we go. Activate. And I just got to point it towards one of the inner planets. So let's select it and select the target. And it can be any of these. Oh, let's go for Moho. It's the one right here at the top. So we'll point that at Moho and this should do it. There it goes. All right. So shake out of four days. Four days from now, this contract should be done. I don't want to jinx anything, but <laughs> this time everything should work. And with my inclination at a miserable point, 0 0.09 degrees, I couldn't leave it at that. So uh, I time warp to the equatorial descending node in order to fix my inclination and get it down as close to zero as I could. But then after that, it was time to get ready to drop the other satellite. So here we are in map view where I hope you can see how this is going to work. I got interplanetary relay one there on the right. I got interplanetary relay two up there at the top. And as we time warp out towards Apoapsis, I hope you can see how the third satellite is falling into a nice position, 120 degrees or thereabouts, from both of those two satellites. And again, the secret to all this is that four-hour period transfer orbit. Anyway, dropping of the third satellite, it's just a rinse and repeat of the second one. I don't need to spend much time with it. I did make sure to deorbit the transfer vehicle uh, before it got too far away from that third satellite. Again, the transfer vehicle doesn't have any long-range antennas. It depends upon relaying through the other satellites in order to uh, have a signal. And then it was just to circularize that third satellite, fix its inclination just a little bit. But we're not quite done yet. You see, 29 game days ago, Duna 1 left the Kerbin Sphere of Influence, and since that time, I have been unable to communicate with it. Well, that is now going to change. I have the dish on this antenna pointed to Duna 1. However, Duna 1's main antenna is pointed at Kerbin, and I have no ability to adjust that. The thing is, is when you point a dish antenna at a celestial body, what you get is a cone of communication, and you can just see the cone of communication coming from way out there, uh, way out where Duna 1 is. You can see that with this antenna, the cone is very, very narrow, but uh, Interplanetary Relay 3 is just about to cross into that cone. There it goes. And with that, I should be able to switch out to Duna 1, and yes, it is alive. We have a working probe. Well, the engine is still activated. Why don't we start off by shutting that down. Notice the time delay? There, the engine just shut down. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about that in just a second. But right now, I'm noticing uh, some rather crazy oscillation here. Okay, flight computer time. This is the remote tech flight computer. And we're just going to put it on the normal vector. There we go. That seems to have locked it down. All right, good. We'll close the flight computer. Take note here. Take a look at the top left here at the delay. It's about two seconds. So every time I put in a command, there's going to be about a two-second delay before that command is executed. And that's thanks to the finite speed of light. Let's get some science going here while we talk about this. We have an atmospheric scan we can do. I have a lot. Let's keep track of electricity, but we'll transmit that. Yeah, there's a two-second delay because the speed of light is finite, and we're getting further and further away from mission control. Uh, and that delay is just going to get more and more and more. Yeah, Remote Tech does uh, uh, calculate in that latency, and it's going to make the flight computer absolutely essential uh, later down the road. But uh, as you can see here, we are done transmitting science. Yeah, not too much to do, not, not too much science there, but it is our first science out of interplanetary space. Yeah, I should uh, activate that commutatron. Again, note the delay. 
There we go. Uh, that communitron is going to be necessary when these two stages separate so that they can communicate with each other. Oh, I got a notification. So let's get rid of this. Come on, we don't have to worry about electricity. There we go. Notification time. Oh, it's another milestone. We have gathered the first scientific data from the sun. Uh, seems like a paltry amount of science and cash and a bit of reputation there. And with Duna 1 finally up and running in interplanetary space, I think I'll be drawing this particular episode to a close. I thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.